So I was officially, I was called Ewing sarcoma, a rare form of bone cancer. Mine was exactly right on my right cheekbone, which is where no one has ever seen it before. Um, it was out of the blue. I was a normal kid eating regular, playing regular, very happy, no side effects, symptoms at all. And all of a sudden it just popped up out of nowhere. Um, and I was officially diagnosed July 20, 2016. When they sat me down in the hospital and they said, Joshua, you have cancer. It's the first thing I said wasn't, am I gonna survive? I knew I was strong enough to survive. I knew I was gonna get through it. The first thing I said was, when's the next time I can pitch again? I'm Josh Cohen, 20 years old from Oakland, New Jersey. Um, played at UConn for a year and a half. Now I'm at Bergen Community College based in uh, Paramus, New Jersey. And uh, this is my story and I caved cancer. What is good, everybody? Nathan Lombardo here with Lambo Media. And across the screen from me, a very, very inspiring guest, Josh Cohen. He currently attends Bergen Community College and plays baseball there. It is a JUCO. He formerly went to UConn, and he has a very inspiring journey because he overcame the battle of cancer. After 251 days of treatment, 14 cycles of chemo, 31 days of radiation, and 12 plus transfusions, Josh Cohen caked cancer. We'll get into that a little bit later, Josh, but first and foremost, introduce yourself for the viewers who don't know you and just talk a little bit about your journey in baseball growing up. Yeah, for sure. So I just want to say thank you for having me again. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, it means a lot to me. Um, I mean, for me personally, um, for my story, I like sharing it to others, not because of what I went through, but because I want to shed light to others, give them inspiration and hope through their own journey, especially during a time like this, like COVID. Um, but regardless of that, um, you know, me growing up, always loved baseball. I was taught baseball from my mom. My mom actually played baseball until uh, her freshman year of high school, and then she got too small and wasn't able to play anymore with the, with the big boys. But wow. I learned from my mom. I was about five years old. Um, that's been my number one sport ever since. You know, I, I went and played basketball a little bit, uh, soccer a little bit, but baseball is my main focus, and I've loved it ever since. Um, just had this passion. It kind of puts me in an environment that takes me outside of all my worries and everything like that, it makes me focus on one main thing, and, um, and the rest is history. Absolutely. And who would you say was that person that kind of got you into the game growing up? You mentioned your mom and how she played baseball all the way up until the high school level. Would you say it was your mom that got you into the game originally? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. My mom, um, she's been my backbone ever since I was obviously born. Um, I'm the third, I'm the third of uh, all three kids here. I'm the youngest and the son, only boy though. So she always wanted to pass baseball down in some aspect. My, my sisters didn't want to play softball. So I was the only baseball aspect of the family um and you know she's my biggest inspiration i try and do all this stuff for her especially through from what she's been through in her life um i try and feed off that and try and make her proud every single day absolutely and you're playing at a high level now you originally committed to uconn played some baseball there and now you're currently at bergen community college which is a juco a very high level juco as well i was talking to eric sim the juco bandit quote unquote the other day and he was talking uh, yes, about sir. the the, the talent level at the JUCO level, and it is no joke. I'm sure, you know, you're experiencing it firsthand. You know, those guys have just as much, if not more talent than some of the D1 kids at the highest of the, of the D1 levels at the Power 5 schools. Who would you say you modeled your game after, you know, on the on the bump growing up as a kid? You know, was there any guy in particular either at the D1 level or, you know, even in the MLB that you kind of try to, you know, model your game after or, you know, that some, you know, scouts even recently compared your, you know, current game uh, to? Yeah, for sure. Um, my number one, my favorite player and someone I like to emulate my game after is Max Scherzer. Um, not because he's an absolute stud and because he's good at what he does, it's because he's such a competitor on the mound. He fights for every pitch, and he shows that raw emotion. And I'm someone who loves to show that type of raw emotion, who really loves to get into the game and not just, you know, not just pitch the pitch. You know, I like to show a certain emotion during the game because I want to let let everyone know who I am and let it let my own my actual self out. Um, so I would say Scherzer. Um, but growing up as a little kid, I'm you know I'm a big Yankees fan. I'm from Jersey. I'm yeah. a Yankees fan, so I always like loved watching Mariano close. I always wanted to be a closer, um, but, you know, I was I was starter, closer, starter, closer, went back and forth. But it was either Mariano at first, and now I'm a big Scherzer guy. 
I love that. I love that. Let's talk a little bit about your high school ball experience. In your senior year of high school, you threw two no-nos, and in 49.1 innings pitched, you had 94 strikeouts, at least according to youth prospects, that you know amazing feature that you had on that post in the caption. Talk to me a little bit about your high school experience and kind of, you know, the development aspect of that and how, you know, how much you got to develop in the high school level to, you know, eventually have the capability to commit to a big school like UConn. Yeah, for sure. Um, high school was a total, total journey for me. Journey for me. Started off as a freshman, 5'4", 5'5", little kid. Sophomore, kind of same deal. I started growing up a little bit. And then I hit this point in my life when I was 15 years old that we're going to get into later um, when I was diagnosed with cancer and everything. And that changed my life total 180. Um, but that's besides the point. Um, so in my high school career, I came back a year later. Um, I had to reclass as a junior and then talk about my senior year. Senior is 2019. Um, my development through high school was, was incredible. And not just from a physical standpoint for me starting to work out, train properly, but from a mental standpoint. Um, I actually took a mental age test when I finished my treatment going through cancer and all that kind of stuff. I took a mental age test and I was 16 at the time. The mental age test said I was 54 years old and that type of aspect really had a big uh, impact on me because I really was able to focus in on the game from a mental uh, perspective. And my senior year, I went into it. I committed to um, UConn my junior year summer going to my senior year. And from that point on, I was like, you know, what? I got to prove to people and prove myself that not only am I capable of playing at that level, but you know, this is me. You know, I, there comes a point in my life where I don't want to be known I love to be known, but not anymore as a cancer survivor. I want to be known as a great pitcher because yeah. that's all in the past. You know, right. I want to be known as a pitcher. So in high school, especially, I wanted to show my skill and show everyone like who I was and make a name for myself. So my senior year um, opening day, I started off with a no hitter. Second game of the season, I struck out, I think, like 16 wow. and a one hitter. Third outing, I had another no hitter. And then from that, I couldn't have asked for a better start. From that point on, I just I finished the year off great. Um, I, I think I led the state in like strikeouts, something like that. And um, it was just an incredible season. I had so much fun with my teammates, my coaches, and um, I left, I really left a great mark there in, at Indian Hills. Yeah, most definitely, Josh. And, you know, one, one key piece I took out of the answer was, you know, how you kind of realized the importance behind mental health and the mental side of the game of baseball right before your junior or senior year of high school. And it seems as if, you know, from hearing that answer, it seems as if that's when you kind of had your breaking point and that's when everything really started to click. And that that's when, you know, you really started to ball out on the bump. Would you say, you know, crediting the mental side of the game and the mental side of, uh, of the aspect of the game kind of helped you take that next step in development? A thousand percent, because when I was sick, I was sitting on the sidelines, obviously in the hospital in and out. I would see my teammates for club, high school, whatever it was. I would see them out there in the field playing having fun like a normal teenager should be. And I was sitting on the side. I was sick, you know, going through what I was going through. And I said to myself and I said to my mom, I was like, I just want to be out there. I just want to play, period. And then she's like, now you really don't think about if you're strike, if you're up at bat and you strike out, it's not that big of a deal now, is yeah. it? Because yeah. it's just a game. And kind that really humbled, made me know. think, it really, yes, it really made me think to myself, like, you know, it really is just a game. It's not life. You need to find right. a way to separate Josh Cohen from the field and Josh Cohen off the field. So for me personally, that really took a big toll on me in a positive way because it's like, you know, I know that I don't, I can't take life for granted anymore. I don't want to take anything for granted anymore, especially the game of baseball, because it's not going to be around forever. So when you're playing the game, just play the game. Like, that's it. Don't worry about anything outside the lines. Don't worry about anything else, you know, and that really made me zone in and focus on what I needed to get done. Absolutely. I love that mentality, Josh. And you mentioned the two no-hitters. And in the second game of that senior season, you also had a one-hitter. I want to talk a little bit about right before that game. You obviously have a pregame bullpen with your catcher right before the game. Did you notice anything different before those two or that even that third game with the one-hitter? Did you notice anything different about your stuff? Was, were you really feeling you know, your release point with your fastball? How, how are your off-speed pitches feeling? Was there anything different you know, going through your head uh, during that pregame bullpen? For me, um, it's kind of weird in a way because when I'm throwing a pre pre pen and I have a pretty good pen, it means my first thing is probably going to be a little shaky. But when I get out there in my pregame pen and it's a little shaky, then I know my first thing is going to be zoned in because like my pitching coach told me, um, he actually just told me this recently, but I learned this over the time, 
is that you need to get your anxieties out in the pregame pen because when you get in the game, then you know what to work on, what's working. So I noticed in that in that pregame pen, my uh, right before that start, that you know something's not working. Maybe one thing's working, the other thing's not. So I'm like, okay, I know what to work with. I know what to start off with. And when I get comfortable in the, in the midst of the game, then I know what to shoot for, and then I know just to go from there. Um, but then I always I just continue to feed off my previous starts, keep that same energy, keep that same mentality of that no one can hit you and the mentality is DGAF. I don't know if I can say it on here, but don't give a, don't give a F right. mentality is I don't care who's up at the plate. I don't care what's happening around you. You need to go at it. You're the, you're the baddest mother, you know, out yeah. there. So that that's the mentality behind it. Absolutely. Like I mentioned, I love, you know, your mentality going on the bump and I want to talk, you know, I want to dig a little more in depth about those two no hitters because not a lot of people have the capability to, to have that feat throughout their career, you know, in high school, let alone, you know, at all. So I want to talk a little bit about that and go a little more in depth about those. When it came to the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth inning, did you at all ever feel, you know, a little more adrenaline pumping through your through your veins a little bit more, knowing that you, you know, had a no-hitter, obviously, in the dugout. You're not saying the two words because you don't want to jinx it, you know, like every baseball player knows. But, but was there any more – added extra adrenaline through those through those last few innings of course and I think immediately especially at the high school level when you're only playing like seven innings it really kicks in that last inning um, when you're out on the bump you know no one's saying anything everyone knows what's on the mind I'm, you know you've seen all these kind of things but you're in that last inning my your legs start getting a little shaky you start thinking okay you know I really gotta locate I really gotta get these pitches down I can't leave anything hanging mm-hmm. because one bad you know one mistake and, and it's gone um, so that mentality is, you know, really zone in and make sure that you're finishing off well, and you're not getting lazy because you can have a great first six innings and then get comfortable. It's, it's important to not be comfortable. My one thing I love saying is in order to be comfortable, you have to be uncomfortable first. Um, so you have to continue doing what was working for you and feed off that. Um, actually another side note on top of those two no hitters that I had, um, I, the game I played before I was actually officially diagnosed with cancer, which was July, 20, 2016. I played in my last game, July 18th, 2016, two days before my diagnosis. Um, and I knew, I knew something was up. I knew something was going on that was wrong. And I basically said to myself, I'm like, all right, you got to go out on a high note because you don't know when you're going to play next. And fun fact, I actually threw a no hitter the day before or two days before I was diagnosed. Cause I was like, you know, what? screw it. I'm going to leave it all out there. Let it all go. And, uh, and that was really the deal. But um, back to my high school, uh, back to senior year, I'm, I've always had that in my bag kind of thing. Like, I knew I've, I've been there before, throwing a no-hitter, perfect game, whatever it was. And I knew what to expect in that last inning. And I knew I just had to, you know, really get uncomfortable and continue to fight through everything because you can't get comfortable in those positions. Wow, that is awesome, Josh. And, you know, as as we, you know, transfer throughout this interview and get more and more in-depth uh, with your story, I continue to get inspired more and more. And like you mentioned, you don't you don't want to be remembered, you know, for having cancer and having, you know, to overcome cancer. And you want to instead being known uh, as an incredible pitcher on the bump and inspiring others. But before we get into that cancer battle discussion, I want to talk uh, lastly about your senior year of high school. 94 strikeouts and 49.1 innings pitched. What would you say about, you know, your game style, your gameplay on the bump led you to having so many strikeouts throughout your, you know, senior year of high school? Do you think it was your breaking ball, you know, late in the count, or would you say it was your scorching fastball? Um, I would say by senior year, it was more fastball dominant. I knew it was, and I knew I had to attack, especially at high school level. Right. Um, Depends on the competition you're seeing, but, by my senior year, I was throwing high 80s, low 90s at this point. I think uh, my last start or something like that in high school, I, top, I was up at 93. So I knew at that level, not many kids are seeing that type of velo, you know, like I said, especially in high school. So I knew I had to attack early and set the tone. And throughout the, throughout the game, there's, like I said, there's no letting up. You got to attack, attack, attack. And, uh, you know, that, that, was, that, that was basically the bottom line for me. Um, continue to attack, continue to keep these hitters guessing. I was basically, you know, fastball, curveball, throwing some chains up here and there. But when you got a good one-two punch combo that you can throw for strikes, especially in high school, you can get away with a lot. Um, and, and that's what I and that's exactly what I did. 
Absolutely, Josh. Well, I want to transition to talking about a very, very inspiring discussion, you and your overcoming of cancer, obviously something you're extremely proud of and you've you know tried to inspire others to overcome as well. Like I mentioned in the intro, 251 days of treatment, 14 cycles of chemo, 31 days of radiation and 12 plus transfusions, but you ended up overcoming it. Talk to me a little bit about that initial diagnosis two days after that no hitter that you threw. What was your initial reaction after finding out that you were diagnosed with cancer and you know that you were going to have to you know battle and overcome it yes sir so um I was originally in the class of 2018 um I was young for my grade so I was going to my junior year uh, of the 2018 class I was still 15 at the time because my birthday's in September and it was around like July um I was at a fourth of July party with a bunch of friends I took a picture with those friends I zoomed in on my face in the picture and I saw something that was a little weird I saw the right side of my face a little distorted, right eye was popping out a little bit. But I didn't think anything of it. I was 15 years old. What do I care? Right. I was probably just growing a lot at the time because my freshman year, I was like 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. Going into my junior year, I was probably like 5'11 at that time, almost six foot. So I grew a lot in that year. Um, a few nights later, I'm out to dinner with my family. I'm sitting across with one of my sisters, Kaylin, and she goes, Josh, what the hell's wrong with your face? My mom looks at me and she goes, she looks at her and she goes, stop making fun of him. But then she looks at me and she goes, wait, something is wrong. The right side of your face looks a little, you know, distorted. It looks like something's wrong. So I'm like, I noticed that, but I just didn't know what it was. Right. So immediately the next day, we went to the pediatrician. Um, that was the first step we took. He didn't, he had no idea what it was, but he obviously didn't like the looks of it. So he sent me to get an x-ray. On the x-ray, no cysts, no fractures, nothing like that. So I'm like, oh, it's a growth thing. I'm just growing a lot. You know, it is what it is. And they're like, no, we'll probably send you to ENT. You're not a throat doctor. Send me to an ENT. They had no idea what it was. They just saw this this mass, not like a mass, but just saw this kind of something. Something was right. It was just weird on the right side of my face, right there, my cheekbone. Right. You know, throat doctor sent us to radiologist. Um, I saw about four radiologists. No one knew what it was, but one of them obviously put a glove on, stuck, put his hand in my mouth, and felt above like my the right side of my face, uh, above my teeth. He's like, it seems like there's like a lip of tobacco in your mouth. I'm like, obviously there's not. So he's like, I don't know what it could be. Um, and I was like, I don't know what it is either. So they sent me to get a CT scan and MRI and that's where it showed up. So I was officially, I was called Ewing sarcoma, a rare form of bone cancer. Um, usually it's located in the hip or pelvis area. Mine was exactly right on my right cheekbone, which is where no one has ever seen it before. Um, it was out of the blue. I was a normal kid eating regular, playing regular, very happy, no side effects, symptoms at all. And all of a sudden it just popped up out of nowhere. Um, and I was officially diagnosed July 20, 2016. I started chemo almost a week later. It was August 1st, 2016. And like you said, I went through all those days of chemotherapy, nine to 10 months chemo. In the middle of that, I had proton beam radiation for about 30 some days, um, which is a funny, funny side story on the side of that is that uh, when I grow a beard, I grow on this side of my face over to my left side because the proton beam radiation I had isn't some type of ra radiation that goes throughout your whole body it was located to the specific tumor, which was in my right cheekbone. So it's like a laser beam. And that type of beam killed off not only the cancer cells, but killed all my hair cells, sweat glands, all that kind of stuff. So from this side over, I don't sweat. I don't grow here, wow. hair over here or anything like that. Um, so that's just kind of funny story. But if that's the worst that came with it, then I'll take it. Um, but overall, that's my story. That's the beginning part of my story. Um, I, took, I had my last chemo April 7, 2017 officially cleared May 1st, 2017. So I'm actually almost coming up on four years cancer free in a few days. Yeah, absolutely. Well, congrats on all, all that amazing feat, Josh. And, you know, it's, it's very, very well deserved because that's not something easy to overcome. And after that initial diagnosis, after you initially found out that you, you know, indeed have, you know, that rare form of cancer, what, what did you say to yourself? What was kind of going through your head, you know, during that moment in time? Yeah, um, it's actually kind of a funny story. Uh, on top of that is when they sat me down in the hospital and they said, Joshua, you have cancer. The first thing I said, and you can call my mom on this and all the doctors. The first thing I said wasn't, am I going to survive? I knew I was strong enough to survive. I knew I was going to get through it. The first thing I said was, when's the next time I can pitch again? When's the next time I can get on the rubber and play the game I love? And that was bottom line. That was exactly what I said because, you know, I knew that was at the age where I was going to, uh, face some type of intense chemotherapy and all that kind of stuff. But I knew that all I wanted to do was pitch again. And, and that was bottom line. And, uh, and that was the rest of history, like I say.
Yeah, that is awesome. And you mentioned, you know, your amazing relationship with your mother. Talk to me a little bit about that and your support system throughout your battle with cancer. You know, what what was your support system like as far as you know, not only your family goes, but your friends as well? So, yeah, as far as my mom goes, she was my back, backbone through everything. Um, she was by my side every hospital visit, every trip to the to the hospital and everything like that. Um, something I always love highlighting is the support I got from my friends and my teammates. As not was I was old and everything like that, but they treated me. I was just a normal kid. They treated me like I wanted to be treated, and also, like treated me like nothing ever happened before. Yeah, so um, I I just love the way my friends treated me because they made me feel like I wasn't just a kid going through some crazy cancer diagnosis and some crazy journey. They made me feel like I was just a normal kid playing basketball, um, eating like crap like a teenager does, uh-huh. and uh, and that was bottom line. That's something that really got me through. My treatment was making me feel like I was just a normal kid and I wasn't going through anything different than anyone else. Yeah, that's huge, Josh. And I, I really love that, you know, inspiring story. And obviously having that support system behind you is obviously very key for overcoming a battle, you know, as severe as that is in, in cancer. So, you know, talk to me a little bit more about that. Was there any moments in particular throughout that battle with cancer that really stuck out to you? That was really, really tough for you mentally to, you know, overcome mentally and physically? Yeah, so there was a point in the time of my treatment, in the middle of my treatment, where I had to get both chemotherapy and proton beam radiation, and that that really got to me because uh, I was losing, I was losing weight here and there. I was in the hospital a lot. Um, I had these sores all over my mouth and my face because of the proton beam radiation and the mix of chemo. It was very intense, very tough. Um, you know, I had a port in my chest, which is where they access all the the lines for the chemotherapy and everything. Um, it really took a toll on me because I was right in the middle. You know, you're not, you don't see the beginning anymore, but you still don't see the end yet. Um, and I was going through a time where I was like, you know, I, like I said, I never didn't, I never thought I wasn't going to survive, but I just like, all right, when can I get this mix over with? That was the hardest part because the trip to the um, proton beam place was an over an hour away. The, the hospital was like a half hour away. Um, so that was pretty hard for me. And seeing in the winter time, my teammates start work out again and lift and, you know, get their winter programs um, starting to ramp up. I was like, you know, I really just want to be a part of this. I really want to just be a normal kid again. And little did I know, I only had two, three months left, and that was it. And I was good to go. Yeah, most definitely, Josh. And I want to, you know, wrap up this awesome and inspiring interview, Josh. You know, with you talking about something you started, you know, after that battle with cancer, cancer, this Keep Smiling Fund. I wanted to kind of plug that in this interview a little bit because it's obviously, you know, something uh, inspiring. And, you know, a lot of people are aspiring to inspire and you're doing that exact thing you went through the battle with cancer you overcame that and you know you could have just pushed it up behind you and moved on and just focused on yourself and your baseball career but no you're doing more to help out the community and people that are going through you know what you went through in the past as well so talk to me a little bit about what the keep smiling fund is and you know why why you you indeed did start that yeah, so um, I'm just a partner in it uh, my friend Andrew over there at keep smile foundation he has a uh, journey and story of himself he lost his father to cancer um and i wanted to partner with him because not only i represent or i would love to represent the type of cancer that i fought which was bone cancer his father went to pancreatic cancer which is a very deadly disease um and i wanted to partner with him because he's touched with so many uh, other athletes and so many other stories i just want to get my own story out there for everyone else and um and just continue to inspire and i thought that the best way is through sports and through my story so with him um, which he continues to share his story with his dad and wants to make sure that everything, because pancreatic cancer is one of the most old, lowly, lowly funded um, cancers in all the world and gets not a lot of recognition. So I love keeping the word out for him and spreading my own story at the same time. Absolutely. Well, I want to wrap up this interview on the on the high vibes. Obviously, you overcoming the battle of cancer is a very high vibe and is very positive based. But I want to wrap it up by talking about your current baseball situation. You know, what is Juco like currently? And, you know, what what's the goal, you know, two to three years down the line or even, you know, maybe a little shorter? Yeah. So, I mean, Juco baseball, totally different, totally different animal than Division One baseball. Um, the structure is different. The environment's different. The vibes are a little different. Um, but you know, it's so much fun. It's, it's a lot more, it's a lot different, like I said, but it's fun. You get to be free. It's kind of like you're playing high school ball slash club ball again. Um, but you know, you know, there's kind of free reign of what you want to do and they kind of give you more freedoms than, than what you would expect at a division one. 
Um, but it's something that, you know, a lot of people need, including myself. It's what I needed in a uh, path I need to go along. Um, but it's definitely gritty. You know, you get these types of facilities, you get these different yeah. practice times and this types of gear and all that kind of stuff that goes into it. Um, it's just a totally different animal, but it's something that I embrace, something I love. Um, and if people go down that route, there's no going wrong with any way you go. Division one, two, three, JUCO, NAIA, anything like that. If you play well and you show out, they will they will find you and you will be seen. Yeah, most definitely. And for the high schoolers out there, what is the biggest piece of advice? Because you're, you know, you experienced it firsthand. You played baseball at, you know, both, you know, one of the biggest power five schools at UConn. And then you also are currently playing, you know, baseball at a, at, at a JUCO. Talk to me a little bit about that, you know, talent difference, because you've played both with and against JUCO talent. I'm sure, you know, you've seen guys that are just as, if not more talented than those, you know, power five school guys. So talk a little bit, you know, about that talent level and competition level, you know, at the JUCO level. hundred percent. I mean, no matter where you go, you're going to find talent and that talent's going to show out. Like I said, it doesn't matter where you go. Um, some people have different journeys and some people may start at a JUCO or division one and go to separate ways, but, there is good talent at, at any level, at in any level. Um, at a UConn, like I said, like I was at UConn, um, the talent was obviously out, the, out of this world, the facilities out of this world and everything like that. But, you know, you find some of that talent hidden in, in some JUCOs like I've seen so far this, this season. Um, I'm only about eight games in at Bergen right here. Um, but, you know, there is talent everywhere. And, and you cannot underestimate the competition or anything like that. It doesn't matter if you're playing at a JUCO or Division One you will find guys that want to compete and want your spot. So a word of advice to some high schoolers is continue. You know, it sounds cliche, but to grind. And you need to outwork the person in front of you and behind you because the second you let up, someone else is going to want your spot. So you can never give up that spot and never give up that that want to win and want to compete with other people. Very, very. Always got to be a step ahead. Absolutely. Very, very wise words coming from Josh Cohen, a man who's experienced, you know, it all from playing at a school like UConn to playing at a JUCO. Josh, really appreciate you taking the time to share your story with me and the viewers of this interview episode. A very, very inspiring story. And I know, you know, from the outside looking in, you're definitely inspiring a lot of others as well. So keep doing you. Congrats on all the accolades thus far on the field as well. And there's definitely more to come. Thank you. Thank you. If I can add something on real quick, I just want to add on a story that I experienced yeah. that really inspired me during my journey. Um, about a month in of my treatment, I was down 17 pounds. I started at 181. In the first month, I dropped to 164. And the, the hospital that I was at was Hackensack Hospital, which is affiliated with the New York Giants football team. And a guy who was playing for the Giants at the time, Mark Herzlich, he played uh, college football at Boston College, linebacker. Um, they were able to set up a lunch meeting with me and him and my family. And I, I went to this meeting, I broke, and I went to their practice, broke down the huddle, watched their practice, met like OBJ, Eli, all those types of guys. And I, I went to lunch with Mark because he had the same type of cancer I had, Ewing sarcoma, except his was in his hip area. And he went through it, he got through it, and then he ended up being a professional football player. I met with him at lunch. We both sat down for lunch. He brought this big plate of food stacked to the, to the max. And I come over about a month in our treatment. I lost 17 pounds. I was in, the, in and out of the hospital, looked very weak with this little plate of food. He goes, dude, you want me to teach you a lesson real quick? I'm like, yeah, please, anything. He goes, all right. He's like, dude, when I was bald, I was fat and I didn't care. He's like, if I had a steak, I'd put it between two buns. If I had a burger, I'd make it a double cheeseburger, whatever it was. He said, you got to eat. You got to make your body fight for you because otherwise, you know, that's the most natural way to make, help your body fight this disease and this cancer. So I'm like, all right, you got Got it. And I said, say no less. So from that point on, I was 164 pounds. I ended my treatment at 208 pounds. I put on 44 pounds in the next months of my treatment because I knew that my body needed to produce and it needed to fight. And that was going to be the most natural way to do it. And that was something that really made me get through my treatment in the, in the colors that I did. I guess you can say the flying colors, but in the colors I did, because I knew that if I was able to do that and he was able to do that, that I can be in the same position he's in one day. Wow, absolutely. Josh, would you say that was kind of, you know, the biggest, most important piece of advice you got throughout that journey? And, you know, would you say that kind of, you know, was the biggest piece of advice that helped you get through it? Yeah, definitely a turning point because I was a month in. I didn't know, you know, you don't know what to expect as a 15 year old kid going through chemo. I had no idea what was going on, no idea how I was going to feel. And that was a real turning point for me because I was like, all right, I can relate to him. He's been through it. 
And now I kind of know what to expect. And I know what to fight for and what to do and how to help myself internally. And, you know, no matter the chemo that was being pumped into me, no matter what kind of drugs they're giving me, I knew that if I was able to do X, Y, and Z, then I was going to get through it and hopefully be a professional like he is today and was. Yeah, absolutely. Well, make sure you guys go check out the Keep Smiling Fund of Josh Cohen and, you know, the thing he's partnering with, as well as Josh Cohen and all socials. Where where can the viewers find you on social media? Yes, sir. So I'm on Instagram. I do not have a Twitter, but Instagram, you get me at josh.cohen18. Um, I would love a follow, anything like that. Share my story. I'd love to share. Um, I'd love to hear any stories from your audience as well. Because I'm open for anything. Love talking about my story. I love talking about other people's stories and um, trying to inspire everyone. So, absolutely. Well, once again, I really appreciate you hopping on, Josh. Best of luck in the future and congrats on all the success thus far. Thank you, my man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.